Uh, so the topic is basically the potential for animal-based domestication in North Gujarat with the preliminary account of Lokishwa. At this time, um, what I can say is I have been um, prevented from doing a lot of my studies right now because of the COVID-19 problems, as I mentioned. However, um, I will present some of the preliminary um, results or, well, not even results, but just a preliminary account of what is happening right now. So just a, a brief understanding of what is happening in, in Gujarat right now is that there, there are a lot of archaeological sites, obviously, that we know in Gujarat. However, um, there are not many, there are not many studied sites in the North Gujarat region in the, with faunal studies. So the faunal assemblages in many of the North Gujarat sites, like they're not, they're not very, they're not very concrete and they are not much solid um, inferences made. So take for instance, um, a lot of archeological sites in Gujarat, you can see that there are a lot of faunal assemblages there. People did a lot of studies, right? There are a lot of um, animal, animal based subsistence in Gujarat region, but in North Gujarat region, it's extremely limited. So on the basis of that, um, I am attempting to determine the animal based subsistence in North Gujarat region, right? What I can say for certain is that recently there have been a lot of um, work related to the plant-based animal, I mean, plant assistance patterns in the North Gujarat region. And that has, has basically raised the question of the animal-based subsistence in the region. So this year, we could take a look at um, some of the, the major sites that have been studied from a group called the North, the North Gujarat Archaeological Pro, um, Project. Now that project is it started somewhere around 2007, and what it what it, it's a collaboration between different um, universities abroad and also MS University here, uh, university also in Spain. So what happened is that they uh, they are taking the initiative to try to uncover what is happening with the inhabitants in the North Gujarat region, all right and. This year, we can see that Rana is here. The site that I will mainly be talking about is Lotishwa. Uh, however, there are also a lot of other sites that are within my PhD study. Right, so as I said, um, so a lot of ex so some of the experts that are doing research in this field are people like Mardella and Lancelotti and Garcia Granero, who focus on flora and plant subsistence study. Connesan Rondelli, they focus on GIS and remote sensing of the region. Balboa undertook studies in geoarchaeology. Gareka has conducted studies on lithics. Ajay Prasad has focused on field archaeology as well as ceramics. Uh, Dr. Rajesh has focused on the ceramics of the region. Ajita Patel and Brad Chase have also added vital contributions to the faunal studies. However, what I can say is that um, there is a need to update and also to have more published information related to the North Gujarat region on the faunal remains, All right? Um, so it is possible that environmental changes during the early and mid Holocene may have affected the natural resources in the, in the region. So that is a statement from Connie in 2014, which basically um, states that there were obviously problems or there were shifts within the environmental, um, like there were environmental shifts in the region and these shifts would have, would have made people alter or change their, their patterns in whatever that they were doing, whether it would have been trade, whether it would have been for traveling, whether it would have been um, to collect water, um, plant-based subsistence, animal-based animal subsistence, hunting or whatever. So um, like this region, basically you could see that um, there is a lot of potential to study the cultural progression of this region. Okay. So this, uh, as um, Dr. Rajas um, said before, I'm a PhD second year um, candidate and my topic is the zooarchaeological investigation into the animal based subsistence during the Mesolithic and Chalcolithic periods in North Gujarat. However, what, what I could say for, for right now is that this presentation does not have a lot of um, solid context because the, the bones that I'm studying right now, they were taken from the surface collection 
So it is basically you could say that the bones may have been commingled together. So there might be representation of different cultural periods within them. So it's a, as I said, it's a preliminary study, right? However, from the PhD, the primary focus of the, of the, of the PhD work is basically to determine the animal-based subsistence during the Mesolithic and the Mycolithic Chalcolithic periods in Northern Gujarat. Right now, based on that, um, 10, 10 sites were selected, were selected as the study area. And these, these sites, uh, those that were deemed with a lot of potential, right, to determine the animal-based subsistence because they, uh, most of them already bear plant-based subsistence patterns. So uh, I, I will get to that later on, but basically what happened is that it shows a lot of potential to see the cultural progression within this region. So these are the, the study sites here that are in um, the dissertation, the, the proposed dissertation thus far, Lotishwa, Dafrana, Laknaj, Varaho, Timbo, Nagwara, Santili, Motipipli, Rangpo, all, all, uh, even though as I was speaking to Dr. Ben recently, um, Rangpur is not directly situated within the, the North Gujarat region. It's, it's on the, the Bal Plains in the Bal regions, but it can be associated and discussed within the North Gujarat region because of the close proximity to North Gujarat. Also Zekda and also Ratanpura. So this is the, the study region here, right? So the study region here, we could look at some of the major sites that will be focused upon within the dissertation, Laknaj will be here, Rangpur, as you see, Rangpur is here, but it's still in close proximity to that of um, Northern Gujarat, Nagwara, Ratanpura, Varal, Timbo. This would be Lotishwa here, Santli, Zekda, Mutipipli, and Dafrana. So all these sites here would be um, the sites that I would be focusing on in um, the proposed PhD dissertation. So what happened is that um, I will highlight some of the some of the glaring evidence of plant-based domestication as well as animal-based domestication from these sites that you could probably say that they are a little bit conclusive, but they're not so solid to definitely say that there is plant-based and uh, that there is animal-based subsistence within, within the region. So Rangpur is located on the fringes of the north of northern Gujarat, but it's specific to the Bar region, as I, was, uh, as I said before. And there were seven different cultural groups that were identified, and they were referred to as RGP1 to RGP7, right? The assemblage, um, the classical Harappan period was within RGP3, RGP4, and RGP7. And 1847 faunal fragments were analyzed from at this site, right? The assemblage contained remains of cattle, which obvious, which dominated. The, the assemblage with 68.3%, followed by goat and sheep bones with 19%, with 19 buffalo with 76 and pig with 5.1%. Now, now, basically, I, I, um, I understood that as evidence of having domesticated fauna, because, because if you're having um, predominantly domesticated fauna on a site, it literally means that you're probably rearing animals on that site. So if... There is a large, so a large percentage of cattle, buffalo, and pig remains bear charred and butchered cut mark, cut mark evidence. So from the, the evidence there, you could also see that cattle, buffalo, pig, um, and pig was, all, was probably also used for meat consumption at the site. And as Goyal, Goyal stated in 2011 within his PhD thesis, it suggests that the large presence of domesticated fauna will cement the assumption that goat and sheep were utilized to satisfy the meat demands at Rangpo. So basically what is happening is that there is, that, that there is domestication happening at the site. Uh, cattle, buffalo, pig, goat and sheep were used for various reasons on the site. So probably, probably they, they would have been used for traction. Others would, have been, others would have been used for dairy. Others would have been used for the consumption of, um, of food. Um, it is it is unlikely it is unlikely that there would that there would be a total plant based domestication and there would not have an animal based domestication on the Rangpur site, right? Another site that uh, I looked at is Nagwara, which was excavated by Patel 
you know, well, not excavated, but the funnel remains was um, was done by Patel in 1989 as part of her MA thesis. Now, the, the excavation at the site of Nagwara revealed a single culture deposit that was divided into two sub-periods, the period 1A and the period 1B. So Hedge claimed that the period 1B showed ev evidences of the mature harapan. Right, so the, within that, 16 different species of animals were identified that included domesticated cattle, buffalo, sheep, and goat. Um, wild animals were samba, cheetah, black buck, gazelle, wild pig, nilgai, wild ass, and hyena. There were other animals, such as the Indian hare, fowl, and monitor lizard. Basically, what this um, suggests to me is that it's also similar to Rampo in the sense that there are a lot of domesticated animals found along the assembly, found within the assemblage. However, you could still see that there is a pattern where there are wild animals within the, the bracket as well. So the assemblage is, but the assemblage is still dominated by, um, by the domesticated fauna. Because as um, Patel suggested, the, cattle, buffalo, sheep, and goat collectively accounted for more than 60% of the entire assemblage. So it must, have, it, mu it must have mean that there was some sort of animal-based subsistence that was occurring at the site, right? Um, Patel also noticed changes in the exploitation of wild animals at the site in different layers. Similar, basically what was happening is that there were, that there were different periods, that there were different periods that she noticed that the exploitation of the wild animals were either increased or decreased. So what was what she stated was that um, there was probably there. This is just an, an inference. So what was stated was that that there was probably a like an, a, a situation of of probably famine or some problem that occurred that made the that made the animal based farming have issues. So those issues made them resort to hunting and gathering wild animals again to basically um, meet the to meet the meat to, to attain the wild and the wild meat consumption within the area. Right. Uh, also Goya reiterates that this fluctuation is indicative of a steady expansion of the settlement into a more stabilized economy. So basically what is happening is that simultaneously while all these things are happening the settlement and the the um the animal based subsistence economy is becoming more stabilized because they're basically like experimenting with different with different means to domesticate the the fauna and try to determine which is the best route to take to come to something that is more solid and concrete that would work for the people on the side so another side that um that I was looking at is the site of Ratanpura. So the site of Ratanpura was deemed to be a Mesolithic hunting gathering community that, that preceded the late Harapans and resided in the Asana district. So um, the band's report is heavily relied upon for any preliminary studies of Ratanpura in terms of the, the fauna report. Anything to do with, with fauna, uh, uh, we have to rely upon band's report. So the site basically revealed domesticated cattle, buffalo, sheep, and goat. The wild animals included cheetah, sh samba, nilgai, wild, wild pig, ass, fowl, black buck, and gazelle. So similarly to the other sites from before, you could clearly see that there is domesticated as well as, as wild fauna on the site. And the domesticated animals also dominated the assemblage with the remains of cattle that were calculated above 67%. Goat and sheep, 13%, buffalo, 3%, with the wild animals registering um, just 16% combined. However, uh, as I was saying, this information alone is not conclusive of animal-based subsistence and required, requires food analysis. Um, it is not conclusive to just say that because a site has um, more domesticated animals mean that it, mean that it is that it, it shows animal-based subsistence in the entire region. That could just be plausible for one site. One site could have a lot of domesticated animals where another site doesn't have a lot of domesticated animals because of whatever reason, right? So a, a strong assumption of large-scale exploitation of wild animals occurred at the site as well. So basically what you see is that like within the different, within the different periods, there were, there were large-scale exploitation of wild animals as well 
as exploitation of domesticated animals at Ratampura. Right? Another site was Laknaj, which was estimated by Sankalya as early as 1941. So Laknaj is situated in the northern plains of Gujarat and lies between the Rupen and the Sabramati rivers on a fossil sand dune known as the Andario Timbo. Right? So Tenbrook in 1965 was responsible for the faunal, the faunal remains report from the site. Right. Um, also, this site was 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 a rich site that a rich manipulated site that had the presence of uh, blades, lunates, trapezes, scrapers, points, and other large tools. Right. So the faunal analysis placed assemblage into three broad categories. One was carnivore, one was artiodactyla, the other was perisodactyla. Right. Within the can the carnivorous um, category. You, there is evidence of mongoose, hyena, wild dog, and wolf. Within the artiodactyla category, you can see spotted deer, black buck, wild boar, milgai, cervus, antelope, wild pig, deer, axis, and the subgenus of axis, buffalo, and cattle. Perisodactyl, there is, a, there is evidence of a rhinoceros, a left scapula, a right humerus, a talus, a molar tooth, and, a, and another scapula was found um, within the assemblage. Right. A total of 40 dental elements recovered from the site belong to bovine specimens. 32 of these were deemed adult teeth in various wear and tear stages. Right. Um, so basically, if on, on a site you have, you, let's take for instance, you have more than, more, more than 40, um, 40 cattle, and those cattle, most of them are adult in nature. Basically, what you're using them for, you're not just using them for consumption purposes because you won't have an animal living to an adult age and you're just going to slaughter it and eat it. It must have a lot of other purposes that you would have been rearing the animal for, whether it be for traction, whether it be for travel, whether it be for, for dairy or to meet some other, um, some other need, right? One tooth was deemed a milk tooth. That was a lower premolar and belonged to a two to three year old domesticated cattle. The charring, present, charring was present on a large number of fragmented bones points to the assumption of open fire cooking at the site, since the community was considered an aceramic community, right? So being an aceramic community meant that they were basically um, lighting, like having like a barbecue basically then. So they were burning the, the, the meat and consuming the meat afterwards. Right? Um, similarly to this, to this site and the other sites that I mentioned before, the domesticated animals dominated the assemblage, but there were also significant wild fauna remains at Laknach. Right? It may be plausible that while possible large-scale domestication may have been likely, there was a high demand for wild animals to effectively satisfy the meat consumption quota of the community. So there are a lot of similarities with most of these sites within um, North Gujarat, where you will see a large um, portion of domesticated, domesticated animals within the assemblage, but also there would be a uh, percentage of wild of wild of wild animals found alongside them, which would probably, as, as I suggested, probably mean to um, satisfy the meat consumption on the site. Right. Um, so this this um, small preliminary that I'm about to to bring forth here is my contribution of the work thus far, because I'm working on this Lotishwa Lotishwa site alongside Dr. Ben and Dr. Rajesh right now and uh, currently conducting a faunal analysis of the, of the faunal remains from this site, right? So this site is, the Lotishwa is located in the Northern region of Gujarat in the Mahasana district. Um, the excavations, which obviously is not my work, but this is from previous excavations. The excavations revealed two different periods at the site, which were the Mycolytic period one and the Chalcolytic period two, right? So um, within the, the Lotishwa, Period one, which is the mycolytic phase, it was mainly consisted of it mainly consisted of wild animals such as gazelle, boar, wild cattle, wild water buffalo, nilgai, wild ass, and deer. However, black buck dominated um, the assemblage within the period one. In the period two, which was deemed to be the chalcolytic phase, um, the period two revealed a lot of the um, revealed domestic domesticated cattle along with other wild animals. Similar to the mycolytic period, there was, there was a significant domination of black buck within the assemblage. So Patel urged for um, 
AMS dating of the animal bones and later confirmed that the bovine bones from the chalcolytic deposit calibrate to the first half of the fourth millennium BC and the third to second half of the third millennium BC. So these bones were basically um, old bones, right? So the early settlement areas coincided with the simultaneous animal based subsistence techniques. So basically what, um, what, what this information is saying that, that these um, bones were commingled together. So there was two, so what was happening is was, was that domesticated and the wild fauna it was simultaneously happening at the same time. So they were exploiting both domesticated and wild fauna at Lotishwa. So um, this site was um, basically an extremely Rich was an extremely rich site in terms of um, plant, plant based, plant based um, analysis, plant based analysis. Um, at Lotishwa, there were a lot of um, macrobotanical remains belonging to the Anata context, right? And the evidence of the charred millets and other domesticated plants are also evident on the site, right? There were also high phytolith concentrations at Lotishwa. There were also starch grain analysis. Um, starch grain analysis that showed a lot of um, showed a lot of different plants that were a little bit resilient to harsh um, conditions, right? So this information is what I um, used to basically highlight that in in the presence of plant based plant based subsistence, there is um, animal based subsistence at the site. It's just to get a little more concrete evidence. Right. Um, so this this is showing a, a size comparison of some of the um, cattle humerus bones that I found within the um, the bones from Lotishwa here. So as you could see, as you um, as you could see here, the smallest the smallest variation was um, sixty seven point zero five millimeters. This is this is measuring the distal portion of the um, of the humerus. And the largest was 98.11 millimeters. So um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure, but I think that it could probably point to an association of when they started, when they left the wild fauna and started to domesticate and started to domesticate animals, because probably the the larger variant of the of the cattle, the larger variant of the cattle may have been a wild species, whereas the smaller ones may have been domesticated species. It's just an idea that are putting forth there from this um, information, right? So more than 700 of the fauna remains have been analyzed thus far. Although some of the bones are extremely fragile, a lot of them are fragmented. However, some have, some bear a lot of key identification markers that um, I would be able to differentiate the animals from each other. But this is, um, like a look of the tentative, tentative graphical information from the site, looking at the taxa, the species, basically the animals that I noticed. As you can see, cattle, cattle dominated, cattle dominated the identified species. Cattle dominated the identified species. Then um, there is a lot of large sized mammals that were like it's difficult to differentiate exactly what what they were. Do there are a lot of buffalo. There were like five buffalo, 10 nilgai, 34 goat and sheep. There was one bird thus far, their species, two sheep, 12 goat, eight black buck, three gazelle, three pig, one camel. Um, there were a lot of unidentified um, medium sized bones. There are a lot of unidentified large sized bone, a lot of unidentified small sized bones because the, the, um, the assemblage was basically filled with a, a lot of fragmented pieces that were undesirable. It was difficult to differentiate exactly what these bones were. However, the from this um, from the identified bones, I was able to the animals identified were domesticated cattle, buffalo, goat, sheep, and pig. The other animals noticed were deer, nilgai, black buck, pig, camel, gazelle, and deer. Uh, put pig um, as well in the wild animals because it's a, a bit difficult right now to differentiate whether it's um, wild pig or domesticated pig. Uh, so this shows um, a radius of a cattle and a radius of a goat. Um, I just have a, a, a small outline of some of the of some of the bones that are recovered from the site. 
So this is an astragalus of a cattle on the left side here. And this right side, from the top, from the top left, this is a, a, um, a molar tree, and then a molar tree of a, of a goat, and then a molar one of a sheep. Then we have a nilgai molar, as well as two cattle molars on this side here. And these were some of the um, identifiable bones that I were able to distinguish from, from the site, right? So the tentative domesticated fauna, fauna data from the site. So the cattle accounted for 75, 75 numbers thus far from the, from the investigated bones. Cattle and buffalo was 13, whereas buffalo was five. Um, cattle and buffalo basically in this, in this, criteria, in this um, graph, it would show the bones that were either cattle or buffalo, probably even, um, even nilgai. So um, then the, the goats and sheep in this area accounted for 29 numbers. Um, sheep, there were two, 12, 12 goats, as well as three pigs. So this shows the tentative faunal data of um, Lotishwa thus far, right? So this is a, um, a humerus of a goat on, on the left side that was visibly charred, right? Then um, a black buck metatarsal on the right. It was associated with a central, central tarsal, but um, there was a lot of um, oxidation on the, the bone itself. So it was difficult to... It was difficult to differentiate the, the age or anything like that, but it was just fused. So Lotishwa, the wild fauna. So this is a, a look at the tentative wild fauna data on the site. So Nilgai, I was able to identify 10, whereas um, I was able to identify 11 their species, black buck eight, whereas gazelle, gazelle eight, right? So the bone um, elements that I identified, so, these bone elements from, you could see that there is a, a large variety of the various parts of the animals on the site. So there is, um, you could see dentition, metapodial, phalanx, flanges, vertebrae, ribs, horn core, there are long bones, molars, tibias, astragalus, humerus, mandible, femur head, scapula, and obviously there are a lot of unidentified, unidentified piece. However, this, um, this could basically show that these animals may have been um, utilized for a lot, of, a lot of different reasons on the site, right? So butchered and charred fragments at Lotishwa. This is just a pre preliminary account. So thus far, um, 48 charred fragments were found, whereas um, there were six butchered um, fragments found um, at the site, right? That could basically show that there, obviously that there was some, some form of um, consumption that was happening at the site. However, what I could say though is that the number of um, butchering and charred fragments is a bit low. However, there were some cattle bones that bear so, uh, a type of grayish brownish film. And it's difficult for me to determine whether it's um, charring or it's some type of oxidation or some kind of soil um, residue that remained on the, on the bones. So, um, a lack of published fauna reports uh, on the North Gujarat archaeological sites have been a major hindrance. Uh, it's a problem because um, some of the some of the the sites is either there is no faunal um, um, fauna report published, or there are or the excavation report is not published, or it's not or it's not done properly because it was done maybe a lot of years ago, not by a zoo archaeologist. Um, so, the, so it's just um, preliminary work. However, um, they have, it, it's been done in such a way that we'll be able to tell that there is possible clues for local domestication um, within the North Gujarat region, right? So the scope for understanding plant-based and animal-based subsistence patterns are extensive in North Gujarat. Um, plant cultivation in North Gujarat showed evidence of adaptability around 7,000 BP to counteract insufficient rainfall. This was evident through widespread domestication of resilient and fast producing crops, right? So, um, Garcia Gonera et al, right? They did some, some studies on the, in the North Gujarat region, specific to Lotus as well. And they found that um, on the site, on the site, there were some macrobotanical remains. And those, those remains point to the suggestion that here, yeah, what there was some type of, um, 
widespread domestication of um, plant based of plant of plants um, on the site, and these were probably um, fast producing crops. And these fast producing crops were there so that they could withstand the um, the environmental shifts, right? Um, my um, other contribution, I would say that it is unlikely to develop plant domestication and totally ignore animal domestication. Um, I think that if it is there is um, large scale plant domestication on a site, there has to be some degree of animal domestication in order to do a lot of these, um, these processes. Because take for instance, right now we have tractors and we have a lot of different machinery that is um, available to us right now to plow lands, to clear lands and to do a lot of different work. However, um, back then it was not readily available for us. So domesticating animals in such a way that they would be able to help meet our needs is something that will, it would have been vital and essential at that point. Therefore, plant and animal domestication are agriculturally linked. They happen hand in hand, right? Goyal reiterates that domestication of animals and plants may have increased simultaneously. So even, um, even Dr. Pankaj Goyal, is, um, he has the same assumption that um, domestication of animals and plants would have, would have been happening simultaneously because a growing need to feed, protect, and secure human communities coincided with the herding of animals. It, um, the new demands arose to feed, pasture and successfully prolong the life of the animals. So if it is um, you're prolonging the lives of, of the, anim the life of the animals, probably there would be some fields that you would dedicate just for feeding these animals. So you would have some type of plant-based domestication just for the purpose of having an animal-based um, domestication pattern. Uh, these are some of the, the references. If anyone wants the references, I, I, I could um, forward it. Um, so I just want to say um, that in basically in conclusion that um, this North Gujarat region, it, it has a lot of um, potential to possibly determine the animal-based subsistence within the region. I just want to acknowledge, um, I want to be thankful to God. I want to especially be grateful to my guy, Dr. Ben, as well as Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Pridanaya. Uh, gratitude to the University of Kerala, gratitude to the University of the West Indies. I'm especially grateful to the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, Sri Pandram Office, and I'm thankful to the organizers and participants of this international conference. Um, suggestions are welcome. Since I am a second year PhD candidate, it would be much appreciated for the members of the panel to provide suggestions that may aid the progress of um, this dissertation. Thank you.